Um, welcome everybody to this session, um, our, uh, this iteration of Creative Futures. Um, I think we'll start off with a few introductions. So I'm Lisa Law, one of the career staff here at the university, and I'm joined today by Claire and Steve. Um, so Claire, do you want to say a quick hello? Yeah, hi, I'm Claire Bookerfield. I'm Faculty Public Engagement Coordinator uh, for the Faculty of Arts, Business and Social Sciences. It's a really, really long title. <laughs> um, but um, I do lots of our public uh, facing events and, and also work with Lisa on these creative future uh, series of events, which have been really successful. Brilliant. Thank you. And Steve is joining us today as our guest speaker. So, Steve, do you want to say a quick hello and just introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Steve Sharp and I'm the head of art and design at Pegasus Academy. So today I'm going to be talking about my career in education so far. Uh, things have been up to, things have been doing, uh, and just showing you a bit of insider knowledge, really, what, what I get up to. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so for anybody that's joining us for the first time, just to give you a quick overview of what these sessions are all about, we've been inviting in different people who are in different kinds of creative roles and fields so that we can find out a little bit more about what their jobs entail um, and what life is like for them, really, and, and um, also to find out a little bit about their career journey and how they got to do what they are now doing. Um, now, teaching, art teaching is something that's really popular, really popular choice for the students that I speak to when I'm seeing people individually and in, in groups out in the faculties. So it's really great that we've got Steve here today to talk to us about what it's like to teach art and design. Um, so thank you, Steve, for joining us today and sharing all of your insights with us. Yes. Before I just pass over to Steve, I'll go through a little bit of housekeeping so we know how it's all going to work today. Um, Steve is going to be sharing a PowerPoint with us, but please do feel free to ask any questions. And the way that you do that is through the Q&A function. If you just hover over your Zoom toolbar, you'll see it pop up and there you can type a question to Steve. Once he's finished his PowerPoint, we'll look at your questions and we'll address those um, in the session. We will have the chat open as well, and that's so that we can post any useful web links or bits of information to you. Um, we're recording today as well, and that's so that you'll be able to watch this afterwards and anybody who hasn't been able to join us can see it as well. And finally, I just want to remind you that this is a public platform, so please don't share anything that's confidential or sensitive today. OK, great. I think that's all the housekeeping. So thanks again, Steve. I'd like to pass over to you now. Thank you. Cheers. OK, well, I'm just going to get my PowerPoint on screen. Um, there we go. Right. OK, so yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, it's really nice to be here today talking to you about, uh, about teaching, about my experience teaching. Um, so yeah, so there's more contact details. If you've got any questions about anything I'm talking about today, or if you've got any issues you want to discuss any further, that's my, my school email address. Uh, and underneath we've got our school uh, Instagram account as well, which I'm posting not quite regularly as, as I would like to be. Or I am putting posts on some of the work we do in school, so you can have a look at things that we want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so my my official roles, I should say, are these. So my, my first role is the head of art and design at Pegasus Academy in Dudley. And I've got an additional role really of a senior, especially a senior curriculum lead for Art Across Dudley Academy Trust. So the way schools are kind of working now is they're working in more Academy Trusts. So you'll have four, five, six, even seven schools uh, linked together. And um, my, my role in, in Dudley Academy Trust is to oversee all the art and design that goes on schools of our, of our mass. So that's my just like what when I was writing this PowerPoint, I was thinking, well, what other things do we do as teachers that don't really kind of come underneath that umbrella of that? So my many roles that I like to do in, in lessons. First of all, I'm a teacher. So I, I do teach say um, school students, um, secondary school students, which are 12 to 16. And I'm also a leader, so I like I say I do look after a team in my school of about six, six people, and also look after a wider team of, of sort of feel for uh, heads of art and design. Um, I'm also a mentor, so I look after PGCE students, so training teachers who come to school, I mentor those for their art and design training courses. Uh, I'm also a carer, so you know, we, we do look after all the students in our, in our, in our care, so we you know, make sure that their, their mental and physical well-being is, is looked after and maintained. That's a, a big part of our, our role as teachers. Um, I'm also an artist, so you know, I'm, I teach art and design, but I, I do like to continue my own artistic practice, and I, and I kind of see my, my teaching as 
my artistic practice in the same time as well. Um, and also a thing which, again, you might not think, but glue lid finder, um, I don't know what it is with schools. I, I, I find glue lids or glue stick threat lids. I'm always finding them and putting them on top of each other. I'm also a printer fixer. Early on today, I printed broke again, so I had to go back and, and fix it and get that sorted, get all the jams out, and also paint, paintbrush cleaner. So you would never find, you would not find a paintbrush in the art classroom which hasn't got a bit of PVA glue on there at some point. You know, these are all the sort of many different roles we do as teachers. Uh, and sometimes I do all these in one day, um, other times I may do one or two, but this is like the, the whole picture of what we do as, as in education. So schools, there can be um, challenging places, they can be very frustrating places to work sometimes, they can be very contradictory, but they're also really, really rewarding places to work. And it's always, it's, yes, it's always, a, it's always a balance to get that, that right. Um, it's a place where I can be creative every single day. So um, if I have an idea uh, for things I want to do or want to change, I can implement that really easily. Um, you can be very, very flexible and creative with your thinking. Uh, and also, most probably most importantly, you are helping shape the lives of, of learners and young people. Um, students who may have not had the same opportunities who, that I've had or, or people have had who, you know, who are in employment and jobs, we can share those skills and that knowledge with these students. Um, and this quote, which is on a little post at Simon Deck, I think is really important. So sharing the knowledge is a secret to mortality. Um, it's, just, it's just a little quote which really sort of, sort of summarises what we try and do and how we help out the young people in our, in our schools. So um, I started teach or started working in education say, in 2006. So I left university, Wolverhampton University in 2006 with a fine art degree. Um, and I literally had no money whatsoever. I was quite, quite broke. Um, and I bumped into my old art teacher and he asked me if I wanted to come and talk to his students about my practice at college and, and university and all the things I've been doing. So I agreed to that um, and I, I kind of went to the school, did a talk. And while we was doing a talk, he mentioned this opportunity of like, potentially doing some part-time work. So I took up on the offer um, and I started work as a TA or teaching assistant, literally just helping out around the department, talking to the students, helping out their GCC work. And I think I was doing that a couple of hours a week. It wasn't that, that much, but um, if, again, if you're interested in teaching, being a TA is a really good way to get in that. You, you, you're not having the full responsibility of a teacher, but you, you're still working in school and working with students. Um, but along that same time, I was still working on my own practice, doing my own artwork. Um, and these are some examples. I was doing lots of billboard posters, um, so a lot of public art stuff. And it took a long time to sort of do and organise and sort of travel around the country doing this stuff. Um, and I kind of was getting a bit disillusioned by it, to be honest. Um, I felt like I'm, I'm putting all this effort into making this work and doing all these different things. But how many people are seeing this and, and what kind of impact is it on, on, on other things? So my kind of thoughts then, actually, could I sort of, develop my you know career into sort of teaching it and, and work in that way rather than trying to be an artist. Um, and so in 2012, 2011, sorry, I started doing my teacher training course. And now there's lots of ways in which you can get into teaching. Um, I did a pro I did a thing called a GTP, which is a graduate teacher program. And um, but the most common one you can do is a PGC, which is a postgraduate certificate uh, in education. Uh, and that course is essentially where you go into a, go to university um, for one day a week and then the rest of the week you're in a school on a placement and normally you do two to three different school placements working different different areas different parts of the um, West Midlands area and just to experience what it's like to be a, a teacher so that's a it's a really good way to get into it and um, so there's other different courses but probably the PGC is probably the most popular that we can come across so I did that for a year, so the PGC course does last just one year, and then after that you, uh, you, you pass to become an NQT, New Qualified Teacher, and then you have to do one further year uh, where you're like, like in probation really, you, you're just working, you know, working in the classroom and doing things, you have to reduce timetable as well, and at the end of that year you fill a few, bits of paper, a few more bits of paperwork in and then you become uh, QTS, so Qualified Teacher Status, so you, you have the official stamp of approval and you can actually then start teaching um, properly. So my uh, finished mine in 2012, um, and the thing I noticed quite evidently from going to different schools and looking around, um, there, was a, there was quite a big gap or disconnect in what I spent experience at college and university and what I saw being taught at school. There was a bit of a, a disconnect, and I always wondered why that was the case. Um, I saw a lot of limited use materials, so I saw a lot of you know, students drawing just with pentacrons or watercolours, uh, lots of realistic drawing. And, and, and quite a few students say, no, I'm not good at art because I can't draw. Uh, and that always really bothered me because, well, you know, we can all make art, we can all draw. It's just the kind of the focus of that drawing uh, could be different. 
And this, this page here, this is actually a Google image search. If you just type in Google, if so draw into Google, this is what comes up, a whole load of realistic drawings. Um, and I think what the Commonwealth with schools at that point was last June to compare their, their drawing ability and artistic ability based on whether they could do realistic drawing. Um, and that, that was really decisive because it meant that some students who could draw really well class themselves as good as art and some students who couldn't draw uh, said they can't make art. And, and that divided the class, which was really troublesome and really um, something I wanted to engage with my, my teaching practice. So I knew at that point my aim was that what I wanted to do is to align what goes on in colleges and universities and industry to make uh, schools, um, you know, a lot more contemporary in their, their teaching practice. And also wanted to get students to exposed to a wide range of artists, processes and techniques. So that was like my main aim. That's the thing I really wanted to do. Um, and I also realised at that point that I could also apply that same amount of conceptual thinking and, and rigour that I was doing to my own artwork within my teaching so essentially my teaching has become my artistic practice and, and I think that I'm, I'm really happy with that that balance because I know some some of my friends who are teachers still do their own artistic practice and when they're at school they want to be doing their own practice at home and when they're at home they want to be doing the teaching so that they this kind of really, really weird balance but for me my teaching is my artistic practice and like I said, I'm, I'm happy to be in that, that position. So early on, I was, I was really influenced by a guy called Chris Francis, who runs a website called Art Pedagogy. Uh, again, if, you, if you're interested in teaching art and science, this is a really, really good place to start. Um, the website's fantastic. There's some loads of really good resources on there to, to have a look at. Um, but he uses some of the key threshold, threshold concepts. Sorry. I've tweaked them a little bit and called them key concepts. Um, Chris Francis has nine, I've got six. Um, and what I've done, I've really tailored, tailored these to be what I think is the most important thing for me about developing and teaching art and design in schools. So the six of them, uh, the first one is artists make marks to communicate. Uh, second one is art is language. Third one, art offers new ways of looking at things. Um, four is art, uh, artists experiment, explore and play with materials, processes and ideas. Number five is artists contest boundaries and direct conventions. And number six is artists collaborate and share ideas with others. So they, these are our building blocks. So all the projects we do, all the schemes we work with do at school, are based around one or maybe even two of these key concepts. Uh, and for me, that's it's a really good way of actually having a good solid groundwork for us to develop off and do it, all these really cool projects, which I'm gonna hopefully share with you today. So like I said, the, the beauty about key concepts, we can develop in lots of different areas. And for me as a leader, looking after lots of different schools, um, I don't wanna to go to the other heads of the department and say, right, all I, want you, all I want you to do is this project, because if that was me, I'd be getting really frustrated with it. So, the good thing about key concepts is that they can actually develop a project in lots of different ways. So first one, you could do mark making, sculptures, you could do experimental drawing, you could do graphics kind of a project for this one, uh, cave art, prehistoric artwork. There's lots of different ways in which you can interpret that, that theme and develop it into a project. So it's giving, giving you know, teachers a bit of autonomy, uh, a bit of space to do the things that they want to try and do. Um, more recently, I've been playing around with the idea of key concepts and also thinking about different ways we could sort of display them. Uh, in the classroom because what i've noticed a lot they, they do link together they do sort of we're doing one project to make link to two or three different key concepts so you know doing things like these little constellations i think have been kind of interesting it's just something i'm just playing around with at the minute really so when you're doing this kind of like work it's quite it's quite sometimes quite it is to think that oh i'm not following what everybody else is doing or working in a slightly different way is, is, is it going to have an impact on the quality? And this quote from David Bell, I think, again, is really, really important. It's not a reduction in quality, but it's a difference in quality. Uh, and if I'm ever feeling a bit sort of fed up or a bit thinking, oh, I'm, why am I doing this stuff? I look at this quote and it kind of just realises, yeah, okay, I'm not doing something a bit different, but it doesn't mean that it's not, not good. It's still kind of good work, but it's done in a slightly different way. So um, I'm going to show you some of the projects and some of the things I've been doing, uh, some of the work we've been doing with, with students. Uh, again, these are the key concepts in action. So all them things I've shared with you just, these are the, the there's in action. Also a lot of experimental drawing. Uh, and also I'm really interested in having an interdisciplinary approach. So I'm interested in questioning what the boundary of art is. You know, can, can, should there be a boundary to art? You know, what kind of things can we do? And all these kind of ideas are in these projects. So one of the projects we do with year seven, uh, in which we link the first key concept, which is artists make marks to communicate, is we draw popcorn. Um, and and the students say, oh, well, why are you drawing popcorn? So what's the point of popcorn? And for me, drawing popcorn is really good because it, it removes straight away the idea of something having to be perfect. I've not really met a kid who can draw a piece of popcorn perfect, and that's the whole point of it. It's something that they can't actually draw perfect. So you, you have to do it in a more 
expressive and experimental way. So we do all these different ways of drawing. So we do um, opposite hand drawing, um, blind contour drawing, um, so sort of drawing with, with two people at the same time, overlapping drawing. So we do lots of different techniques with drawing to just, just get to be a bit more experimental, a bit more sort of uh, creative with their approaches to drawing, to making artwork. Um, and then what we do, we come to see the sketchbooks. Um, I'm a big fan of these sketchbooks because um, the traditional kind where you've got like an A4 page and it opens up, I, I, we don't really use those at all. We, I, I don't like the fact that you can't just see students' progress in one line. Uh, whereas these constant sketchbooks, once you've opened them out, you can see all the work they've been producing. And you can see it uh, as it kind of develops and, and sort of changes over time. For me, it's like a really important um, way to develop um, my sort of recording of the students' work. Um, and, and again, I quite like the fact that when you actually look at these, it just looks like a load of scribbles and a load of sort of weird marks. But then when you talk to the students about what we've been doing, they say, oh, yeah, I've, I've drawn this picture of my elbow, or I've drawn this you know, image with you know, a weird pen or a different material. It all kind of makes sense, but for anybody looking in from the outside, it just looks, looks like scribbles. And I call it that, that kind of play with what they expect to see in an art lesson and what they actually get. Uh, yeah, different sketchbooks there, different, different examples. Um, and then once we've done the, the drawings, we develop these into little sculptures. So using bits of wire, bits of string, bits of wool. And, and with some like, really, really cheap sort of like pound shop sort of torches, we just sort of cast some shadows onto the sculpture and then we sort of photograph them. So again, it's kind of the idea of, you know, not just pencil as, as the only tool to make a mark we can make a mark which is 3d we can make a mark which is a shadow we can make a fault not mark which is um, a photograph so there's lots of different ways of of mark making and capturing that mark making process and some really, you know, really beautiful nice photographs this one we're just literally using the sun coming through the window and the classroom and just record that process yeah some more different sculptures and students you know using lots of different process, you know, using cameras, using basic model making techniques. And then uh, we get the photographs, put them into Photoshop, and then they can have a play around with experimenting with them in Photoshop, uh, exploring different, different filters, different effects. And again, I really like this idea of layering projects. So they initially start off with drawing, then we turn into a 3D mark, then we turn into, into a, a photograph, then we turn into a shadow, then we turn into digital. So this whole load of different skills that are going on within the one project. Um, this is the 10 project, which links key contact number four, which is artists' experiments and materials and processes. So the challenge for these year 10 students was to make a drawing without using the hands. So we kind of played around some different ideas and experiment with different ways of working. Um, and some of the students like to create these um, sort of like wire sort of cages in which we hung a pencil or a bit of chalk from the middle, and then the power of the wind would blow these chalks and make really beautiful drawings on a piece of paper. So that was a plan. And then when we did it, it was the calmest day. In fact, there was like no wind at all outside. So we had, a, we had to come up with plan base where to go around the school and raid and try and get all the, the, the electric fans we could find. And then we used these fans sort of on the edge of the desk to blow the, um, the bit of paper to make the marks with a pencil. Um, and I kind of quite like this idea of them quite makeshift, they're not perfect, they're just interesting the contraptions that we use to make these drawings. And I also like the idea with the fact that this is that we, we add a, like a time element. So some of these fans are left on for an hour, exactly. Some of the fans are left on for 30 minutes, some of the fans are left on for like four hours. And so the time became the point when the drawing was finished. And they're going to quite like that idea of, you know, when is a piece of artwork finished and when is it not? And um, the one on the right is um, a sculpture which we made or drawing towards we made with bits of foam board and some like split pins. And they try to draw with that. And again, the process and the, the way of working was I think more interesting than the, the final outcome. Of a, of a shot of the same thing and again we did some really beautiful little, little videos of these and you know a bit of chalk sort of bouncing up and down and some of the marks you, you would never ever guess um by hand you know you can only be made in this kind of process and again that's what I like about that that's way of working and that's chalk so this was a, a bit of an offshoot project for this one really and then um, when we was working on this project, uh, which links to key content number six, about collaborating with other people. Um, some of the students talked to me about the, the pendulum paintings, which they, they saw on uh, Instagram. And they said, oh, have you seen these pendulum paintings? I said, oh, I had I seen a few of them. They, they look really cool and interesting. And so they wanted to have a go at doing that because they said, oh, yeah, actually, we're not using our hands. We're making a mark of pendulum. So yeah, it fits in the project brief. Um, so we started doing one. And um, I didn't have a clue how to do this. I've never done one before in my life, but we had a go together as a group. And the first one we did ended up like that. And it was a bit messy. We had paint was too watery. 
it just literally fell out the cup and it just went everywhere on the floor. So we thought, okay, we'll try again. As another goes, some of the paint was too thick um, and the holes a bit too small, so it wouldn't go through properly. But the pattern looked kind of quite nice, but it wasn't quite there. And then the third one we did, we, we threw the, the little pot a bit too far off the page, which went all over the floor, covered the floor with ink, um, and we missed it totally. And that was the end of day one, and we could have like, easily given up, given up there and think, actually, you know what? We can't do it. It's going to be too tricky. Um, we're going we're gonna to have to go again. So the second day, um, we had another go. Got a, a bit more better. We was playing around with the height of the cup on this one and got the cup just to the right height and it kind of looked okay. Then it started to improve and we got a better one. We missed off the edge of the paper on that one. And then by the last attempt, we got it, we got it right. We got a, a really good uh, image created. And, and what I really loved about this experience and looking back on this experience for me, the fact that there was no like, hierarchy of teacher and students and me telling you what to do. It was literally, it was, was fine there together. I was experimenting uh, and all of our ideas were like valid. You know, some of the students said, oh, what, what if you move the cup up? Or what make the hole bigger? Or what if you make the string longer? All these different sort of ideas that they had was coming to the table and we just experimenting with them. So for me, it was a bit of an interesting sort of experiment and different, interesting way of working. And I think, you know, could I do that in the future again, where I come to a lesson, not really to make, but we're going to find it together. And I think that's a, it's a cool, interesting idea of, of developing this further. Um, so another little project we've been doing again with year nine. So this again is a like a little experiment, really, um, asking the students to make a sculpture out of five objects, which they find in the art room. So this one is again it's one of these lessons where they kind of go off, they just hunt in the art room and try and find five objects. And again, from the person looking on the outside, thinking these are just random objects put together, placed together. Um, when you actually start breaking this down and, and talk to students about the work and say, okay, well, why have you picked those five objects? What relationship has those five objects got together? Um, why are you putting that in a certain location? Then it starts to build up um, an interesting sort of little artwork from this, this one point. So the one on the left, one of the students said, okay, well, these are all the materials that I've used in the last couple of less art lessons. So they've used the scissors, they use a paintbrush, and they've used a glue stick. You know, so it's kind of, it's all very conceptual, very sort of thought-based. Uh, and I think that for me, that's a really interesting way to go. It's kind of work. Um, again, this is a, one of these projects. I had um, some students, some PE students actually observed me doing this lesson with students. And, I was just looking thinking this is like totally not what I'm used to in my art lessons. And that I think is a sign of, you know, I think for me a good lesson. If I have people come in and say, this is what, you know, this is what, not what I did when I was at school. I think for me, that's a, that's a positive because I don't want to do the same thing we did 20 years ago or 15 years ago. I want to do something new, relevant and contemporary. This is another which we're doing, uh, what we, so we did before Christmas, uh, where I asked the students to create a piece of artwork specifically on a non-art based software, so things like Excel or Word or Publisher. Uh, and the idea is to create, a, create a, an abstract artwork using these programs. So yeah, we've just experimented around with this and some students started to have a go at making work um, just by colouring the little boxes in, little, little cells. And then on this one, you, you might be just able to see, but this one here, we've started to use things called conditional formatting, which is a bit like painting by numbers in reverse. So what you can do, you can solve in a number so if you put a number into a cell, it will generate a colour. So the students like this idea of painting by numbers in reverse. So we started to play around with what that would look like as, a, as an image. And then these, these were printed out and, and put into a sketchbook. But I, I really like the idea of using these programmes, which are not designed for making art, but to use them in a really creative way. Uh, this, one, this, this one girl really <laughs> went for it. She just made really cool, interesting things. She did some stuff on there, which I don't know how to do on Excel, but we were just playing, experimenting just trying things out. And the key concept this links to is number five, which is art to contest boundaries and direct conventions. So we are rejecting Photoshop, We're not using Photoshop for this project, um, all these illustrators and those, those normal art programs. We're just going to play around with non-art specific programs and see what, see what happens, see what we produce. Um, some students did some more like realistic stuff. So they did like more like pixel art things. But um, I think for me, the ones that when they're in a bit abstract and a bit just weird and a bit strange, I think were my favorite ones out of all of them. Um, this is quite a big project I've been working on um, with these guys, called, um, which are a company called Hunjo's Coffee. Um, I'm really keen on working with businesses and companies um, out there to sort of make the, the learning in the classroom extend beyond the classroom and, and you know, work into different, uh, different areas. So these guys, uh, Jim Matt and Annabelle, who, who run the company, um, I reached out to them um, after seeing some work on their website, which I, I really liked, uh, and asked if we could like, work together on a little project. Uh, they agreed, it was great. So um, Annabelle, she came to school and she did a talk to the students about coffee, where it comes from, um, how it's roasted, how it's manufactured. Uh, and the idea was that the students were going to design logos to go on their coffee bags 
which then get sort of sold and distributed around, around the country. So the theme was looking at Ethiopian uh, art and Ethiopian culture. So the students said about creating some logos, um, which would go on the back. So again, it's, it's a country that I didn't know that much about to be honest, Ethiopia. So we, again, we'd learn together as a group, we'd find all this information out about the country and, and what goes on there. Um, and the yeah, students made really nice little logos. Um, and then from there, we started to develop poster designs and uh, different, different works. Again, still using those traditional techniques, so the person, the voice, uh, one student there is actually using uh, not really nice hand drawing techniques and, and sketching some coffee plants and then putting the logos on top of the students just directly using Photoshop and, and just working on there. Uh, different styles, different ones. But yeah, the whole process was a really nice experience because all the way for the process, Annabelle coming to school, talked to students about the work. She was, she's ex Royal College of Art, so she knows what she's talking about in terms of art. So she would advise students on how to develop it. But it's a, it's a really cool experience. And again, students responded really well because it's not me giving deadlines, it's, it's Annabelle. You know, Annabelle's going to come in, in two weeks and if it works not really, it's not going to be seen, it's not going to be judged. So it, it added a different kind of pressure to the work. This was done with year 11. Um, we just did coffee bags. So we did some little bags and we print onto the bags and um, did the logos, sort of examples. Uh, and some students had little coffee cups as well. So little coffee cups to go with. Uh, the bags, different types of labels. Um, and also, this, this, at, the, at this time, we did this during the end of the lock, the first lockdown. So I was really pleased with the project. It went really, really well. Um, and I wrote an article for NECAD, so um, it's the Art and Design magazine. Um, NECAD is like the uh, National Society for Education, not in Zion, which is like the main kind of group that supports and promotes arts education. Uh, and they, they released a monthly magazine, uh, sorry, a, a quarterly magazine. Uh, you can subscribe to the magazine. Uh, and have it but yeah the, the article that we wrote actually kind of made the publication which is really really good and again from that we sort of developed the program a lot more we did some more projects with them so it's it's really interesting to see that that little project start from something really quite small then developed into quite a big uh, interesting project we're actually still working with a company now doing um something called coffee pour over stands uh, in the, more like a free design project that's working really well and we're doing a slightly different variation of the, the logo design project uh, with my year tens at the minute actually so it's it's still going on we've still got a, you know, a good relationship working with each other so it's a, it's, it's a nice little project so um this is my classroom and, and one of the highlights of the year for me is, is when we have the end of year art exhibition so what we do we literally close down the whole classroom so the whole classroom or the normal normal lesson the uh, gcc work on display uh, we normally do this for the for the moderator, so uh, he or she comes around and marks the work. But it's uh, again, it's a nice opportunity for students to sort of have a look at uh, like an art gallery style uh, space where we can see all the students' work. Um, and all this work's hanging up is all the design sheets. So again, we don't really use sketchbooks, but we use design sheets, which is on a computer. Uh, it's just like a digital sketchbook, basically. Uh, and all the work on the table is all, all edited. And for me, it's, this is the best bit. You know, this is all those, that two years worth of hard work at GCC, working with students, having sleepless nights trying to you know get them to do work trying to you know get them to do things and um, it's all kind of comes together at the end and we have a really good exhibition we have all the parents come in and we have all the, you know, the governors and the staff coming to schools when i look at it uh it's, it's a really good thing unfortunately obviously because of covid and lockdown all those things we, the last exhibition we did was in 2019 so hopefully fingers crossed um we can have an exhibition this year and kind of get back to normality because it's uh, something i really miss miss doing so a lot of hard work a lot of effort but it, again it's really worth it, yeah. And also, when we get to this project, it's it's really like what they want to do. And, and again, for me, it's not me telling the students that you go to this. It's like, what would you like to do? And then we, we have a discussion, we have, we have a, a talk about it, and then we develop ideas from there. So this piece on the right actually is quite interesting. This one is a sculpture. We took some students to Wolverhampton University, sorry, Wolverhampton Art Gallery, and she took a lot of photographs of the architecture of the building. And she was interested in the idea of how we preserve buildings in the future. So these little plastic domes are, are the idea that these domes go over buildings and they protect them from all different pollution and, and preserve them for future generations. So she was interested in the idea of how we look after stuff and how we look after the local environments. Um, the piece on the left is a, uh, the, the girl's name, but it's been abstracted and played around with and, and made to really kind of pull up to a geometric sort of abstract image. And again, um, on display and exhibition but again it's, it's a it's a bit at year 11 i think for me it's that's the best part of it when we sort of talk to students say what do you want to do and how it's going to develop in the future 
Um, so I've put a few books in here um, of things that really, have really inspired me through my teaching career so far, and um, things that again might help you if you if you're interested in working this kind of way. So uh, No School Manifesto is a really good one. Uh, Taking a line for walk again. All the weird little activities that I've been doing, you know, five object sculptures, that kind of stuff comes from these these books. For me. They're, they're really useful and really good ones to look at. And uh, Wicked Art Assignment is fantastic as well. Um, and learning by heart. So again, if you if you want to definitely background context to what I'm talking about, what's going to work, then definitely check these these books out. They are they're really useful. So um, what I've also done here as well, I've put some um, some rules really for, for working. Um, which, you know, I said rule, but it sounds quite formal, but it's really just ideas, strategies, things that I think I would like to have known when I first started teaching. Which I've kind of developed over you know, the last fifteen years or so, been in, in education. So just just different strategies, and ideas that you can you can work with. So the first rule that I always do when I'm working at school is simplify a fraction. And, and what that actually means for me is reducing things down to most simple, most basic sort of elements that I possibly can. So if I'm doing a worksheet for students, I'm not overcomplicating it by having loads of information there. I make it really simple, really straightforward, so that you know message getting get. If I'm doing PowerPoint, I was thinking back in my head, okay, well, I'm going to just have a maximum of 30 words in the PowerPoint and a few pictures. And it's just making it as simple and straightforward as possible. And by doing that, you're not sort of overcomplicating the situation and making things difficult for yourself. So simplify the fraction is a, a really important one for me. And the next one is think punk. Uh, and what I mean by this is adopting a DIY aesthetic. So um, I'm a big believer of not just waiting for something to happen. He's just going out and doing it. Um, one of the reasons why I'm doing this talk today is because I, I emailed uh, the guys all from the university and asked if we could do a talk and they said yes. You know, just putting yourself out there, you know, having a go and just trying things, it's, it's you, you're surprised what things happen. And I think in education, especially, um, you have got so much autonomy of how, how you want to do things or how you want to teach art and design. Um, you, you can do it in lots of different ways um, and it's up to you. So you've got to just go out there and just have a go and just try things. Uh, next one is question everything, nothing is sacred. Uh, and like I said at the start, really, you know, sometimes um, teachers don't really question what's been gone on before because it's that's what you get. So these projects get handed down to you from the old art teacher or somebody else, and you just deliver them, carry on delivering them. But sometimes it's nice question to say, like, hey, why, why are we doing, why is there a big focus on realistic drawing or observational drawing? It's a, it's a different way of doing things, we're going about it. And just by just stepping back and just looking and observing and questioning why we do things, you can actually then see other paths and other ways of, of doing it. So yeah, question everything, nothing is sacred. Uh, be visual. So when you're doing PowerPoint, when you're doing work, um, yeah, make it as visual as possible. I think for me, it's, it's the best and easiest way to get your message across to students. Um, if you show a picture, if you show a reference to something, uh, it's a really clear and, and simple way of communicating your ideas. I do a lot of my um, feedback marking visually. So if, if a student asks me to something, I'll, I'll Draw a picture of it, or or if I do a little demonstration, and as long as I'm signing that with my initials so that the students doesn't use it, then that's that's fine. That gives them a bit of feedback, and they can actually see me doing the things I'm asking them to do, which is again really useful. Uh, don't pressure your ideas. Ideas are free. Um, I think people who, who struggle with generating their own ideas, what tends to happen is they'll they'll have an idea and they'll hold on to it really tight and they run their go. Um, and I think creative people, people who are good at generating ideas, have lots of different ideas, and then I'm quite happy to sort of kind of throw these ideas around. And if one of them works, great. If they don't, then they just come up with some more ideas. So yeah, don't don't be worried if one idea doesn't work. You'll have another idea real soon. It will come up with something, um, and you can develop your work in that way. Next one is uh, be open-minded. So it's really important to sort of be open-minded, try things out. I'm I'm constantly trying new things out. Even, even though I'm like so six or well, 15 years into my teaching practice, I'm still in, interested and, and willing to try new things out and see how things go. Um, and again, if things go wrong, it really matter too much. You can always backtrack and, and, and change things later on. But you know, think of it as a, as a not failure, but as a, a learning opportunity. So that was my six rules. So again, that might be helpful for you guys if you're thinking about doing a career in, in education. Um, so What's next for me? So things I'm interested in, things I'm doing, things I'm, my new interests that I'm working on uh, at the moment. So one of the things I'm really keen on doing at the minute is experimenting with art and science. Um, we got donated a 3D printer from Wolverhampton University um, a couple of weeks ago now, and uh, the um, the guy who brought us over was, was talking about art and science. We were just having a little conversation about that, and that, the, yeah, that kind of spurred me to sort of start thinking about 
um, could we make drawings with machines or with robots or with your unusual processes? Uh, and again, this idea of having an interdisciplinary practice, questioning the bounds of what art and design could be. Um, and the bottom one there, bottom right hand corner, was actually my attempt of actually making one of these drawing machines. Um, we've got a laser cutter at school, so we had to go laser cutting out one of these things. Um, hope in the future we can get to, to do something like the, the big of a picture or the one with the turntables. But that's kind of the thing that I'm, I want to sort of play with next is how can we actually make these things which actually spin or rotate or make a, make an image. Um, you can buy some really cool little turntables which are used for photography based things. I've, I've actually bought some of them recently and we're going to have a play around one of those trying to make some of these images. But yeah, linking art and science is a, is a cool one. Uh, another one is art and maths. Uh, I've recently come across this website called GeoGebra, which is like a, like, a, like, a, like a really good version of Excel, but it's all online. Um, and mathematicians and scientists put all these weird like equations and things which go right over my head. But if you just type in art into the search bar, you get all these weird little art related sort of activities which students can play around with and experiment with. And I think any idea of where this boundary between art and science, or art and maths lies, and can they be the same thing or can they, and they're different? So I'm, I'm really interested in playing around uh, with that. Um, also, Tom Sachs is, a, is an artist, again, who I've recently come across, and I, and I really love his work. I think it's really interesting. Um, I love the fact that it's quite transparent. You know, they, you can see he makes these things out of glue, um, you know, glue gun stuff. You know, we use um, he uses plywood as well. So it's all materials that we use in school. He's using as well to make these kind of really interesting art objects. Uh, and he does a lot of things with recreating and that craft and, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting guy to, to look at. One of the, um, the big things I'm sort of doing a lot of the meetings is doing a lot of work with PGC students, so training teachers. I've uh, done a workshop actually last week with some uh, students from Birmingham City University. Um, and again, some of the strategies that we do with students in school, I was doing with them last week. So this is um, making a sculpture of five objects in the art room, which we found. Um, and I really enjoy sort of working with PGC students. I really enjoyed the process of actually working with Sort of older people and sort of giving that, those these skills and knowledge which I've got from teaching and passing that, that on to onto these guys and, and seeing their careers develop and it's, it's a really cool experience. And this is another example of one. So this is making a drawing um, without touching the paper. So this one on the left hand side to me shaved the pencil to literally nothing and all that the little bits of shavings went onto the page and when we blew away the dust we had like this really sort of quite like faint atmospheric little drawing that's done uh, and the one on the right I think that was drawing a screenshot piece of newspaper, I think. So again, experimenting with materials, processes, um, and different ideas of making artwork in the classroom. Um, and also again, it's like workshop. So um, we, the practice was taking photographs of all the things we making on our phone. So I was, when I was going back home, when I finished the session and I was traveling back home the bus, I started to doodle over some of the photographs I took of the work. And uh, again, playing with very filters and effects and just thinking about how we can take that really simple idea of an image and then start developing this and, and experimenting a bit more. So yeah, that's a, a really kind of interesting thing that I want to try and continue and develop in the future, really, you know, my sort of engagement with um, post, uh, sort of PGC students and working with uh, these guys um, on their training courses. So really just last, last little thing really guys, um, all we got to remember, we all, we're all students for life. We all, we're always learning, we're always finding things out. And I think um, if you've got that in your mind, when you kind of come to teaching or if you're interested in doing teaching, it will sort of to be, I think, a, a really successful teacher. And um, one is open-minded uh, and one is willing to have a go to things. So thanks for listening. Uh, if you've got any questions, please feel free to come on the chat. I can have a chat if uh, and answer the questions hopefully if uh, need to. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Steve. That was really interesting and insightful. And it was just, what, what struck me really was how your teaching is your creative practice like you said and how it seems that every year is different because you're always coming up with new new projects um, and getting the students as well to come up with their own ideas and um, you sort of work with them collaboratively um, yeah so thank you very much that was a really good insight okay. um, if anybody does have any questions please please do just ask uh, pop them in the Q&A or in the chat um, and I think we've got one question that's coming, haven't we, Claire? Yeah, um, so a question uh, from a student. Uh, I'm interested in running adult workshops post pandemic to get groups together for relaxation, etc. Lots of things you've said are interesting to apply in this situation. Is there anything, any further advice you could add to that? 
Um, I just think just I think for me it's taken away the pressure of actually trying to do something perfect. I think uh, uh, the main thing. So, like I say, with the popcorn project, nobody's going to draw the popcorn perfect. Um, you could do that with a plate of noodles. You could do that with a bin bag, whatever it could be. You know, there's lots of different ways of doing that. So, I think taking the, the pressure of making something perfect and realistic and detailed is a, is a good place to be. Um, and I think then that will just frees people up to be a bit more expressive, a bit more creative, a bit more experimental with the work. Um, and again, just just playful. I think that's the thing. Having a, having a play with materials, experimenting with it, just trying different techniques out is, is, a, is, a, is a good way to go. And lots of them books, uh, probably, I'd say the best one, probably that Wicked Art Assignments. There's lots of different little activities in there which you can actually read uh, and then sort of develop into a little workshop for, for adults. Um, like I say, I've done a similar kind of activity along with students in school with uh, PGC students and they've kind of worked quite well. They, you get this kind of like, bit of like a strange look on the face thinking, why am I doing this? But when you explain the context and the background, right, and they, they soon get into it and it's a, it's, a, it's a good way to work. I think what strikes me is that um, everything you said about what you what you teach and your your methods and your processes from, from someone having also done a, a degree in fine art, what, what you're doing seems like such a great starting point to then for, for further education to, to then go on to your, your degree I, what I, I just really like what you're doing and 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 how you're what you're doing is sort of getting people to to think very differently yeah I think that, that it's just a comment really yeah more than a question but I, it just it just strikes me that what you're doing is really really interesting and what you're getting the students to do is um it's very much a, a, the same kind of thinking that, that we get at university and I think yeah. that's that's just a really that's just really lovely to see that's so I refreshing think, yeah I think that was the issue when I said when I, when I first started to teach I just noticed this massive gap between the two things and mm. and yeah I still see it a bit when I go around the schools and have a look around and, and see them doing things in a certain way and I think sometimes it's if you just like just challenge yourself a little bit it's actually right when I just try this different activity to see how it goes and and, and to make us from there but I think sometimes some people teachers think we're so restricted on what we do and we're not really we have got a lot of freedom a lot of flexibility to do things in the way we want to do so yeah like i said you know it's about questioning stuff stepping back thinking why are we actually doing this stuff what purpose has it got and also how is that student if you're teaching say observational drawing and you're drawing i mean say a shoe which is like one of the things most people do what skills in there are going to lead on to that student being able to be successful in their in their own right later on um, or what kind of experience do they get from drawing that show if it's not a, a, a good one or if it's not it's got much merit there's no point doing it it's need to be doing something a bit different so it's yeah it's about learning what's going on and also as well we don't want to be giving students um, a massive gap when they go to university or college to sort of try and mm. to try and reach you know um if, if we and again i work a lot with, with colleges it's making sure that what i do in school links what they're doing so there's like a, a seamless, seamless transition from one to the other um Obviously, your practice is very interwoven within education and your job. But um, do you ever get the chance to exhibit yourself, or do you collaborate with other artists? Do you ever? Um, I used to. Like I said, when I first started, I used to do my own art projects. But I just became a bit sort of like disillusioned with it. I just thought, well, I didn't really see that many people, many people sort of like viewing this stuff, and and also teaching is like. Is, is a really sort of time intensive job and, and it doesn't really leave time for doing all different things um but i think for me i'm happy with that that balance of actually doing um my own teaching practice within you know, within uh, education and that's what a lot of artists did like in the 60s there's like quite a few artists who who did that um fed up got fed up with their, the, uh, with their own practice and then went into social work went into education and i think for me i can have much more of an impact on on people and and where they, where they think through it this rather than sort of making artwork which only a small group of people people can see um and i think that's that's for me is where i, I really enjoy being uh, i think in the future i mean again you know doing things like this really help and i enjoy sort of you know sharing the you know, knowledge about teaching for people and it's it's yeah it's just a different side shoot of what art education is all about and i think some people think well sometimes that because you're a teacher you've you kind of like sold out or you, you're not a proper artist and i kind of hate that kind of that kind of viewpoint I see what I do as a serious professional job, and, and you know, again, it's another, another sort of part of the constellation of what art and science all of those. Yeah, no, that's a really nice way of putting it. Um, so we've got a lot of thank yous here, which is really lovely. Okay. Uh, and one from Euripides, who's a um, photography lecturer, and he said, "Thank yeah. you, Steve. We need more teachers like you." And I totally agree with that. Um, 
So um, how is teaching in lockdown? Could you could you expand a bit on that? I know you, you sort of touched on it earlier. Yeah, very, very difficult. So, I mean, again, for, for our kind of subjects, art and design, where we were talking about objects and things and different things, it's it very tricky to do. So we did a lot of our online work. We did a lot of, sort of workshops and um, live lessons. Um, and I was keen, I know, I, know, I know quite a few people were doing this kind of stuff where it was like a, a Bob Ross style kind of, I do a bit of a painting, you do it. I, I wasn't going to go down that route really with my way of working. So we did a lot of activities where we have students to sort of do things like what we did, I'm going to share with you now, like doing little mini exhibitions of objects or doing um, workshops, uh, doing little activities where students make artwork out of food, uh, recreating artworks with food. So lots of different kind of creative fun things. And I think for me, it was, it wasn't about sort of saying, okay, right, well, we're going to continue where we were before and just do the normal work. You're saying, okay, right, well, this is a different situation to school. So let's just go with that different situation and do something a bit different, a bit more so you know, exper experimentational and a bit more a bit more fun as well. So for us it was quite difficult, but yeah, we we're glad we went back into the normal classrooms now, normal situation, um, which I think is, uh, is the best place to be. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you've got any more questions, pop them in the chat. Um, Lisa, do you have any? Yeah, I was going to ask you about your workload, actually, Steve. I've heard that teachers have a, a massive workload because it's not just the in-person delivery with the students, but there's all of the marking and making sure that you're ticking the box for Ofsted and probably countless other things as well. So so what's that all like for you? Yeah, I mean, you yeah, know, it's... <laughs> Again, there's this misconception that I think teaching, you know, you get you, know, you get your Easter holiday and your Christmas holiday and your summer holiday and, and you, you, you finish at three o'clock. Yeah, we do work those hours, but within that, after that time, we are working, we are doing things. Um, it is this is quite a, a big workload of, of different things you've got to manage, but I think if you do get the balance right and get the balance in your favour, it does become a lot easier. Um, obviously, we have a lot of PGC students coming through the school and they say, oh, it's, it's always like this. Uh, and obviously they've got to do a lot of lesson planning and they've got to do a lot of work. So I'd say that the, the, the workload never really kind of goes down, it just shifts slightly. So um, to, to myself personally, I don't write that many lesson plans because I know my schemes work, I know my projects off by heart, so I can just deliver that stuff. But I do a lot of sort of quality assurance stuff and a lot of uh, observations with people and obviously all my mental roles and all that different things. So my workload has shifted from planning a lesson to doing more of a managerial sort of like leadership role really within within um, school so yeah it never really goes down it just sort of stays the same but it, but for me it's, it's something I enjoy doing and I think if you enjoy doing this it, um it's important and it's not it's not it's never going to be a job where it's like a nine to five you come back home at five o'clock and you forget about it it's, it's never like that it's it's continually developing sort of practice and I think you know many times I've been out somewhere and I think oh I've had an idea for doing that and I'll write it down and then I kind of act on it later on so you, you kind of constantly in this kind of I don't say working all the time but it's you you are you know it's in the back of your mind sometimes that you're going to do this but it's if you enjoy doing this I think that's it's not hard work really and that, for me I enjoy doing this and I, I like how it works. Mm. Yeah it sounds like you're really passionate about it mm. and it's something that sort of flows through you right yeah. the way across your life really um is there anything that you do find quite challenging at all yeah i mean like at the start, there is there is challenging bits to everything and i think sometimes the challenging can uh, comes from a lot of time the fact that you are working with with students you are can be a bit unpredictable and a bit of i mean like today today is just really wet and windy and today my year 11 class will just really just, just you can see those just not focus at all um that can be challenging that can be you know you think, oh, just, just sit down and get some work done yeah you, you can you, you really sort of trying to do the things you ask them to do um but in that situation then you can think actually right let's just stop what we're doing let's just say right let's we need to be focused we need to be working and it's just using that professional judgment really if you you know when the student's not working on task or when they're not, not doing the things you want them to do so you just got to step back and say right let's have a break let's go for it again in a different way so that that can be quite quite challenging and i'll say you know if, if you don't get the balance of the workload stuff like that, that can be challenging as well um i've always kind of um tried to do as much work as i can at school so that when i come back home at night i haven't got to do that much um, although i may do like little bits and pieces but again it's, it's kind of getting a balance that works for you i think for me that that worked but i know all people who like to leave at three o'clock and then they do a lot of work at home and then you know that if that works for them, that's that's fine. You've got to do something that works for you in your lifestyle and the way you, way you like to work. Um, so yeah, just it's um, it, it, yeah, there is there is challenges, there is, but I think the the, the good parts, the positive stuff, definitely outweighs all all the negatives. 
Um, I mean, I remember one one situation we had uh, one lad who had a lot of uh, learning difficulties, lots of issues going on. He, he was he was struggling um, reading and writing, um, but he loved drawing, loved making artwork, and he was one of these kind of kids who, who never really got noticed um, with his peers in the school. The, they knew he was there, but he, he was just kind of got part of the crowd. Um, and uh, he came to art once. He did a uh, did a picture with uh, some chalk. Um, and I've begun to do like large scale uh, drawings on its cardboard, old cobble boxes. And uh, we framed up in some cheap IKEA frames that we bought. And then we got them to, I showed him next, went to next, the classroom next door to me. Uh, and I said, oh, come and show your work off, go and see, and take it next door and show the teacher next door. And we took it in. And he showed all the kids, and all the kids started looking and sort of clapped him. And I just felt like I was so proud of him, the fact that he, he kind of got, got this work done. And he went from a kid where his head was there, not this. Pretty much most of the time to head up and his shoulders are back and he was you could see he was so proud and everybody knew him for his fantastic artwork rather than just being the kid who you know nobody we talked mm -hmm. to and, and that for me was one of the most important sort of points really in my teacher i think that's what i need to be doing more of so if i have a student who makes a little piece of work i say i'll go and show miss so and so or mr so and so and go, go and show it off and that that just does like so much so much good for students and their the confidence and the morale it's it's, it's unbelievable yeah, I can imagine that was a, an amazing moment. And if it continued afterwards and helped him sort of long term at school to yeah. make friends to do, and have, yeah. Yeah, he went on to do GCC at the end, we, 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 going through his GCC, and he, like I say, he went off to college and did it as well. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really nice when you get students like that who who do, you know, grasp it and like, say, well, I'm going to go and take something as a career or pursue it a bit further. And uh, I think, yeah, it's a really nice experience. Um, I mean, another experience as well I, we had was um, a girl. A couple of girls come through from um, from middle school. They came in, and they again normal happens. You get you get students who come from other schools moving around, um, and also you've got to try and integrate what they've done in previous schools into like your way of working so that they can get a DCC sorted out. And I remember they came in. They bought these really beautiful sketchbooks of drawings and and, and pictures of plants and things. And we, I was flicking through looking for the work, and I said, "Oh yeah, it's really nice." And um, we, we sort out a plan for what they want to do to develop that project forward, um, and they carried on doing that. Then. Literally, like two minutes later, I was cutting a barber doll in half in the band saw for a new student. And I remember the, the one girl who, who we spoke to, she was looked at me thinking, this is just totally different to where I've come from before. And it was like, what is going on here? Um, but that's that's the nature of like what we do. You know, it's, it's, there's no material, no processes are off the limit. It's just, just full on experimenting. And, and what I was really proud of, that, that girl who came with these beautifully neat sketchbooks, she ended up doing some really cool animations. And she's got like a big like installation in the art room, which is still there actually now. Um, and again, I, we, I was glad that we kind of got it from being doing this very tight, detailed drawing to something a bit more free and expressive and, and creative. Yeah, it sounds like the opportunities to be creative at your school are just mm -hmm. the huge opportunities because you yeah. let it happen. You sort of facilitate that for everybody. Yeah. Um, and I think that that can be, like I said, a double-edged sword as well, because obviously when you've got a group of so like year 11 students, which I've got like 20 odd students in the class and they're all doing different projects, you're constantly plate spinning you know, and making sure the more doing the work, make sure you've got all the materials they need. So it's, it's very time consuming and very sort of labour intensive, but I think the outcomes at the end are much more uh, interesting and more varied than if we just said, okay, well, we're all going to draw still life or we're all going to draw your shoe or we're all going to draw wherever it may be. So it's, it's, it's kind of building that point from year seven onwards where they can actually go away and develop their own skills and actually come up with their own ideas of things that they want to try and do. I think what is also really interesting is your own career. So starting off as a TA, then a teacher, and now your sort of management level, overseeing several schools actually, yeah. and other staff, and you're a mentor as well. Um, what do you see yourself doing in the future? Um, I, I, I think it's one of the problems like all art and design teachers have is that if, if the more that you move away from the subject you enjoy doing, the more... Yeah, the more you miss it. So I think I'm I'm kind of happy at this point where it's time I'm I'm doing looking after the other schools. Uh, I'm doing my head of department role as well, um, and I still like, I still do a lot of teaching myself. So I think if I move away from that, I'd be I'd miss being in the classroom with the kids, doing the artwork, making the stuff. That's where my passion lies for it. Um, I, I'm like I said, I'm keen on interested in doing more things with uh, sort of PGC students working with, with, with the guys. Um, doing like talks like this, well, I'm, I'm really keen on doing. But for me, it's just like there's always there's always like an opportunity around the corner of things I could do. Like I said, the art and science stuff that I'm experimenting with. Um, I'm experimenting with and um, doing some sort of different work with, um, yeah, so like sort of like motorized work, so like more like say scientific kind of things. 
uh, and working the science department on that. Um, we've just done a really good workshop with the British Art Show um, programme. We've been part of school with them. So there's always something going on, always something happening, which I think just keeps me interested and engaged. I think if I come to a point where I just got bored and I got fed up, I, that's the I think, time to me to say, oh, I'm going to leave, I'm going to do something different. But look, there's always something around the corner uh, for me to work on. Do. And I'm just also thinking, because you mentor trainee teachers, probably you get involved in deciding who gets onto a teacher training programme. What do you look for in new recruits? Would you want them to have particular sorts of experience or, or um, um, skills or... Oh, yeah, what? I mean, I mean, a bit of experience. I mean, it does help. I mean, if you have, if you've had a bit of time in school for working in education, um, that's 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 two advantages. It's not, I wouldn't say, it's essential. Um, but yeah, having a, having that bit of a candid attitude, I think, and, and willing to get stuck in as well. I think if if you're there and you're willing to get stuck in and have a go, I think that's probably for me the best thing. Um, another thing as well is, I mean, again, one of the, one of the ways in which I got my job initially as a, as a TA is that when I went into the school and I started doing a bit of part-time work there. Um, at the end of that first year, when I was offered a full-time contract, I said, well, okay, what I can do for you is I can create a CD with all students work on there, and then we can hand it out for the art exhibition. So in my interview, I listed, said, like, this is what I could do for you, rather than me saying how good I was, or you know, what qualifications my background was. I said, well, I can do X, Y, and Z for you if you employ me. And I, and I think that was really kind of quite key because, um, I think if I've got somebody coming to me saying, OK, I can do this for you or I can deliver this or I can support you with this, I think, oh, yeah, I can see that person do that in my classroom or working with that person to do that. So it's, it's a, a little spin on you know, an interview technique, really, but I think it's a, it's, it's a good one to have up your sleeve, really, just saying what you can offer that person um, and what you can actually physically do for them as well. That could be in any sort of interview process you want to, really. But I think for me, like I say, having somebody who's got a candid attitude and just willing to have a go and get stuck in, um, is the main kind of requirement really. We can do all that background, so we can do, we can show the teacher and how to get involved with, with you know, students and how to talk to students. But you, you've got to, you want to, you've got to do it yourself, really. You've got to want to do it. We're just coming up to the final few minutes of the session. Um, so just uh, to say to everybody, this is your last chance to ask any questions. Um, Claire, was there anything that you want to, uh, you wanted to ask Steve before we finish? Um. I guess at what, at what point, Steve, did you think, yeah, I, I think I think my uh, my future's sort of lying within education? Because obviously you did find art the same as me. And I guess when you went into your degree, what did you did you have an intention or you know, did you want to come out of the end of it being a teacher or did you want to be a full-time artist? What what were you all sort of um yeah. original thoughts really when you were doing your degree well I, I i knew i wanted to do something related to art that was like that was like clear i knew i wanted to carry on doing my art practice um yeah. and i wanted to i wanted to do an ma but obviously two things had happened obviously i got a job in the in, in education work in the schools of ta um and also at the end of that year um it was 2007 going to 2008 so we had a massive financial crash so there's putting a lot of money out of the art education uh, funding for arts projects and, and, and galleries and things like that so it was either go and try and make as an artist there in London, I wanted to go to my MA in Chelsea, um, or have this, you know, grab this contract, this full-time contract, which I had, and, and work for that. So I think I grabbed the, you know, the contract and, and went that way. But I was, I was quite lucky because I had a really good mentor who, who helped me um, for that, that process of, you know, working in the school. Um, and he, he used to be ex-design council. So he, he knew the, inter the issue between art and design education. So he really helped me to support me with, with what I was doing and, and really kind of give me um, the contextual understanding of where, how we come got to this point in education, where we've come from and where we potentially could go. So that kind of really interested me and excited me thinking actually this is something I could, I could work with and, and, and do. And uh, he was the kind of guy as well who'd say, like, yeah, just, Kind of teach what projects you want to do and he would obviously check what i was doing first but he, he gave me that bit of freedom a bit of flexibility to do what i wanted to do and and for me that was quite a liberating experience and i think then it was at that point i kind of made a connection with well actually i'm doing all this hard work going around the country doing these art projects but i can do this here and i can have a similar kind of impact probably even more impact with the students i'm teaching and do something in a similar kind of way and so at that, that point it was definitely kind of the penny drop to think actually this is something i want to try and do but throughout my career, I've taught, um, I've taught on design, I've taught 3D design, I've taught photography, I've taught graphics. So I've done the whole spectrum of different 
you know, Austin Zondi's has played with him in school and I've, I've kind of enjoyed doing all with him really. Um, I think there's, there's not one which I think that's the favourite one. And, and again, for now, my, my sort of career, I'm mainly focused on, on the art side. I've got the skills to sort of go and do a bit of graphics if I want to, or if I want to do a project on in more like a 3D one than I can do that. So it's, it, it has given me like a really good setup to to do different things within the classroom. I suppose your, your mentor, you're kind of him now. And yeah. it seems like, um, you know, he must have had quite, quite a big impact on what you've become. I would say, it seems when you were talking then, you, you've kind of become him. And, and now hopefully people, you know, you'll have that knock-on effect of it. Yeah, yeah really that, that's, nice about that. that's, that's why we've got that quote, you know, you know seek to, um, you know, immortality, sharing your knowledge. It's, it's that's what happened. Yeah, you know, he's passed that information on to me, yeah. and then I've got that information, and I'm passed on to the people who, who are trained. So it's it's like it's continual this process, and and I always want the trainers I work with to be better at teaching than me. And I think if you've got that kind of idea, and then, and some of them have been better than me, or hopefully will be better than me in the future. Um, and I think if you, and I'm, I'm always kind of conscious of trying to give them as much as I can uh, some of the time and and, and energy. We're getting their practice right because I think when you, when you get it right and you, you're in the classroom and then the kids are working with you and you've got to make some really cool work, it's like the best, mm. it's the best feeling ever. You know, it's, it's, it's really, really good. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful for Chris for his mentor to, you know, to help me out and support me with that. Um, and, and just give me that knowledge, really, you know, of, of, of saying to me, yeah, you can question stuff, what you know, why, why, yeah. why are we doing this work in a certain way? Could you do it slightly differently? Could you do it like this? Could you do it like that? So yeah, it was really kind of quite, um, you know, inspirational really for, for my career. Yeah. I think your students are very, very lucky to, to be in your class. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. Just thinking back to my school days and what we did in the classroom, yours yeah, looks and seems very, very different to that. So, yeah, we've come to the end of our time today. So a big thank you, Steve. Thank you so much for cool. sparing a bit of time because I know you're very busy to come in and speak to us. Um, it's been really interesting and useful. Um, and for any of the students that are joining us today, if you are thinking of getting into teaching, there are some quite specific things that you need to know about teacher training pathways and how to apply. And what I would recommend is that you get your personal statement checked. Um, so the career service can help you with that. Um, and if you'd like to book a, an appointment, you just need to go to our web pages. So it's the university web pages forward slash careers and then you can access our support. Um, and in terms of creative futures, just thinking about what we, we've got coming up, our next session is a big one, actually. We're doing something on campus in the new Screen School. And this is going to be on the 1st of April from 9 until 1. And we've got a, a fantastic programme of about uh, six guest speakers coming in to talk about their careers in um, areas such as visual effects, games, animation, TV, and videography. So it, it'll be a really good one. Uh, all you need to do is, is book your place um, because places are limited with it being on campus. Um, and yeah, you just need to go to our usual web pages to do that. Yeah, I'll pop the link in the chat. Sorry, my computer is very slow. The weather is not compatible with the internet at the moment. Um, I'll just pop that link in the chat. Um, yeah, booking is essential for that um, because places are quite limited. Uh, there we go. Okay, and then after the 1st of April, we're reverting back to Zoom. We've got a few more sessions planned for that as well. So uh, check out what we've got coming up and sign into anything that interests you. So thank you all and we'll leave it there for today. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.